The sermon title today may now have that song by the Who stuck in your head, especially if you have been a fan of the TV show CSI or my new guilty pleasure on Wednesday nights, The Masked Singer. I, and I'm going to out you, Dr. Lockhart Gilroy, we are captivated by this new show that airs on Wednesday nights where a group of celebrities compete anonymously in costumes over a series of episodes. And each episode, a portion of the competitors are paired off into face-to-face competitions in which they perform a song of his or her choice in their real voice behind this mask. And then from there, panelists and a live audience vote, and the winner is safe, and the loser's put up for an elimination and a face-off. But at the end of the evening, an eliminated singer has to take their mask off to reveal their true identity. And of course, that song by The Who plays at that time while we're waiting on that unveiling. Now, in addition to the singing competition, hints are given to each of the singer's identities in these pre-taped interviews where the celebrity's voice is distorted. So you really don't know a lot of times until they take that mask off. And there's all sorts of speculation. And certainly on Thursday mornings down at our end of the building, Dr. Lockhart Gilroy and I are comparing notes from Wednesday night's episodes. So it makes sense that I would be drawn to a show like The Masked Singer given my own academic research interests around identity constructions. In fact, the very nature of our concentrated class this week is a cultural history around the identity constructions of Jesus in the context of U.S. American society. Eric Barreto reminds us questions of identity are at the center of the Gospels. In both narrative accounts and explicit identifications, the Gospels weave a number of portraits of Jesus. And in doing so, however, the Gospel writers are not just interested in correctly identifying who Jesus is, but also in shaping a community molded in light of his actions and his teachings. And so these questions of identity are not just a matter of definition, but of formation. Not just doctrine, but discipleship. The gospel text today is a rather well-known passage. Here, Jesus gathers his disciples, and he takes a little poll. He wants to know what they've been hearing. Who do people say that I am? And the answers they offer link Jesus to other voices for God, from John the Baptist to Elijah to Jeremiah, among other prophets, right? And Jesus then says to them, but who do you say that I am? And the answer to the question is given by Peter, who offers what we have come to know as the good confession. You are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus tells Peter that his knowing comes from God, not from his own wisdom. Even so, divine knowledge withstanding, Peter continues to struggle with what that means in practical walking around terms for Jesus to be God's son and how he and the other disciples fit into this picture. Those of us who read Peter's confession today must also answer Jesus' question and the others then that bubble up in response. Who is this Jesus? That's a question that's been asked down through the centuries. Because Jesus was a religious figure who is revered by at least some as being of divine origin, A distinction is sometimes made between the Christ of faith and the Jesus of history. And while some Christians see the two as being one and the same, others do not. When it comes to answering the question of who Jesus of Nazareth, the figure of history, is, there have been many quests. Most of them have ended with the questers, as Albert Schweitzer suggested, seeing a reflection of themselves within the dominant culture, also in Jesus. 
So we have become accustomed to seeing a blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesus who looks very European. People have remade Jesus into their own physical image, but we also tend to remake Jesus ideologically. Therefore, for some, Jesus is liberal, progressive. Then there's conservative Jesus. There's radical Jesus. There's reactionary Jesus. Yes, who is Jesus? True story. A church in suburban America put on a passion play for their community with the hope that people would be inspired and spiritually nourished as they presented the last days of Jesus' life and his resurrection, and they pulled out all the stops to make it as professional as possible, rehearsing it for months. No amount of money is spared. And so on Good Friday, the night of the show, they were pleasantly surprised to have a full house. Everything went well during the first part of the play, presenting the Last Supper and the trial. The problem occurred during the crucial crucifixion scene which had the actor portraying Jesus dramatically hanging from the cross. What the cast did not realize was that the glue that attached the rubber head of the spear to its pole had hardened to the point that the spear was no longer as flexible as they had thought. So one of the soldiers, played by a junior high boy, caught up in the drama of the moment, stabbed Jesus with the spear, with as much gusto as possible, and Jesus on the cross cried out in pain, Oh God, I've been stabbed. <laughs> and while the audience had never read those exact words in the Bible, they figured that it was possible that Jesus could have said something like that. The stage manager, however, realized something was wrong and quickly brought down the curtains and everyone rushed to the bleeding Jesus who had to be taken to the emergency room for a few stitches. Well, the cast and crew decided the play has to go on, so they made preparations for the final scene, the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And Jesus' understudy felt that he could do it. Now, while the understudy didn't have a beard like the original actor did, who was to say Jesus didn't lose his facial hair when he was resurrected, right? I mean, the crew had worked long and hard to make this ascension as realistic as possible, even bringing in the apparatus known as Peter Pan weights. Wires attached to the body of the actor portraying Jesus with sandbags as counterweights, which would normally gently lift Jesus into the air as he ascended into the heaven, but what no one thought of was that this new Jesus weighed about 30 pounds less than the old Jesus. So when the final scene came, the new Jesus was jerked up in the air, letting out a shriek, disappeared into the rafters rather forcefully, hit his head with a loud bang, and his two sandals fell to the stage <laughs> before the shocked disciples. And for the second time that night, Jesus had to be taken to the hospital. <laughs> In a world influenced by such a variety of dynamics, many people think a hurting Jesus needs to be rushed to the hospital or protected somehow by our religious freedom laws. You know, some people believe that Jesus has no efficacy for today's world. Some think that the church has failed to present a relevant Jesus. And some think that they know the story so well that they don't even pay attention, oblivious to the fact that Jesus has become implicated in a bait-and-switch scheme. I see stories in the news on a daily basis that make me wonder where Jesus is in the policies made by public officials who profess a connection to Christianity. Christians are followers of Jesus, right? Then what do their beliefs and practices have to do with the actual words and actions of the person of Jesus? I almost feel like the Jesus I know from the Gospels, there's been a bait and switch in American culture. 
Randy Woodley, a scholar of missiology at George Fox University, notes that while it is true Jesus was born into colonialism, he is the stellar example of a decolonized mind. By this I mean his life and teachings appear to place him neither as one who understands himself to be a powerless victim of oppression or an oppressor. Instead, he sought to free oppressor and oppressed alike from the chains of colonial structures and thinking. Unfortunately, cultural choices were made over time by leaders who followed the Jesus way to turn the Jesus way into a hierarchical system that could then be co-opted by the empire. And by choosing to operate on and through hierarchical principles which match the Roman hierarchy, Christianity was easily assimilated into empire rather than demonstrating freedom from empire. And theologies, of course, eventually developed that were a throwback to this hierarchical thinking, creating stigmatized classes of people and the use of hegemony. In researching readings and documents for this concentrated class this week, one that I came across was an essay written in 1901 by Swami Abedananda titled, Why a Hindu Accepts Christ and Rejects Churchianity. And Abhidananda suggested the necessity of distinguishing between the pseudo-religion found in many churches that he calls churchianity and the true Christianity taught by Jesus the Christ as the Son of God as an incarnation of divinity in a human form on earth. Jesus asked that we name who he is and not only name him, but also claim him. Who do you say that I am has everything to do with who you are willing to be, including within the context of community? Jesus, in referring to his followers as an ecclesia, church, probably meant the community of the faithful that would persevere in his teachings as his influence lived on following the faith that awaited him. Peter may not yet understand his confession, but he would take the leading role in what would become this new work of God in the world. And Matthew attributes breakthrough significance to Peter's confession. He presents it as a fundamental divine revelation of who Jesus is. And Peter's able to make this affirmation about Jesus' identity because God enabled him to recognize Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter's confession is important in its own right too because from it we learn who Jesus is. But we also learn from it who Peter is and who Peter will be the one whom God inspires to publicly confess Jesus' identity. Now, it would be easier for us to stand on the outskirts of this scene, observing Peter's reception of his new special status, but Peter's confession is our, is our confession as well. And so is his commissioning as followers of Jesus, who is the Christ, united in community with other disciples also interested in learning and following the way of Jesus. I don't think Jesus is asking us to parrot back the answers we've heard or read. And maybe that's why he's pushing the disciples to move from what they're hearing about him to what they're hearing within themselves. Who do you say that I am? That's not an easy question. And I wonder if sometimes we too readily accept and settle for those Sunday Jesus answers. You know, the easy, feel-good, sentimental ones. But the problem is life isn't always easy, feel-good, or sentimental. It's one thing to say who Jesus is here in Tulsa, Oklahoma today in relative safety and comfort. It's a very different thing to say who he is outside of that. And the question is never merely academic or abstract. It always has a context, and the daily news provides many sobering examples. 
Who do we say Jesus is following the death of Joshua Brown in Dallas and the increasing racial tensions in our country? Who do we say Jesus is when refugees cry out in need as people in our own city go to bed hungry who live in the midst of domestic violence or work for a wage that cannot support a family? Who we say Jesus is has everything to do with who and how we are and who we will be. And in some ways, our answer says as much or more about us than it does about Jesus. It reveals how we live and what we stand up for. It guides our decisions and determines the actions that we take and the words that we speak. And it describes the expectations and the demands we place on Jesus and discloses our own depth of motivation and commitment in following him. Jesus' question isn't so much about getting the right answer as it is about witnessing and testifying to God's life, love, and presence in our lives and the world. It's grounded more in love than understanding, and there is nothing safe about the question Jesus poses. How could there be? There's nothing safe about Jesus or the life to which he calls us. Jesus' life and presence among us call into question everything about our lives, our world, the status quo, and business as usual. And that's why we ought not to answer his question too quickly, too glibly, or without much certainty, or with much certainty, sorry, because it's not a question to be figured out as much as it is a question to be lived. 